Good afternoon and welcome to the International Space Station National Laboratory Sustainability Challenge event focused on plastics alternatives. I'm Patrick O'Neill with the ISS National Lab and I'll be your MC for this event. The International Space Station is an incredible research platform that has supported more than 4,000 experiments from an array of research disciplines, including life, physical, material sciences, technology development, and academic inquiries. However, one of those areas of research and technology development has seen a rapid rise in interest from potential ISS collaborators that's been focused around sustainability. In fact, recently the ISS National Lab held a sustainability workshop focused on how the space-based research environment can mitigate the effects of pollution on our planet. Which leads us to today's event. In 2021, the ISS National Lab partnered with global prestige brand Estee Lauder to announce a research challenge seeking to utilize the orbiting laboratory to advance sustainability R&D that specifically addresses the worldwide plastics dilemma. Plastic waste is highly prevalent on Earth. It's in the land, the sea, the atmosphere, and the ISS represents a one-of-a-kind platform capable of enabling scientific and technological discoveries that can mitigate the widespread effects of plastic pollution. This sustainability challenge with Estee Lauder represents a unique opportunity for researchers to propose concepts that utilize the ISS environment to develop, test, or mature products or processes that address this growing issue. Through today's virtual event, you will hear from representatives from the ISS National Lab and Estee Lauder on the importance of this partnership and impending research. You will also hear from thought leaders specializing in ocean plastics and sustainable packaging on the challenges faced with this dilemma. Lastly, Everyone loves an astronaut's perspective, especially one that has been in space for more than 200 days and taken more pictures from the orbiting laboratory than anybody else. But before we kick off this conversation, there was one unique twist to this challenge. Unlike most research solicitations, this challenge required proposers to submit a video pitch. Why should their science ultimately be selected to launch to the orbiting laboratory? How would it benefit humanity and our planet? How could this further knowledge in the development of future plastics alternatives? In doing so, this would allow for the general public to better understand ways in which researchers are considering leveraging the orbiting laboratory for science. The six finalists for this award created videos that have been made available to the public, and the public also had the opportunity to vote on their favorite pitch. Today, we will showcase the top three vote getters, and at the end of this event, we will announce the Viewer's Choice Award for Best Pitch. So be sure to stick around for that. So without further delay, here is the first of those three finalist pitches. Hello everyone, my name is Xing Liu. I'm a researcher and engineer in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Hello, my name is Pat. I'm also a researcher at MIT. We present MicroPET, Enhancing Microbial Consortium for Plastic Biodegradation. We aim to identify the consortium of microorganisms that can efficiently degrade polyethylene or PET waste and produce high-value plastic monomer, BKA, a precursor for nylon. This process is known as upcycling, using the unique environmental stressors in the International Space Station, including microgravity and radiation, as selective pressures and catalysts for the sustained enhanced bioactivity. Motivation for the project. Our prior work on MicroPet1 identifies Pseudomonas putida, a microorganism able to break down polyethylene and upcycle it into BKA, a performance advantage byproduct that can be polymerized into nylon. Our collaborators at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, has a long-standing experience in large-scale manufacturing of plastic upcycling applications. Our output of the experiment provides a sample and data on high-yield microorganisms that can directly be integrated into the ground development in NREL and somatic PET depolymerization platform. For the hypothesis and research question of this proposal, we hypothesize that a consortium of microorganisms, including Pseudomonas putida and auto microbes, can improve the efficiency in the degradation of plastic waste and production of higher value plastic materials compound compared to a single strain microorganism condition. Further, we hypothesize that the microgravity and radiation of space can serve as the selective pressure that could catalyze and sustain the enhanced upcycling activity once the microbe return to Earth. For the rationale of using the International Space Station, Research has shown that stress response caused by microgravity has induced microbes to have enhanced bioactivity that allows the cell to have a higher metabolic rate. Microgravity also changes the microenvironment of the organisms due to lack of buoyancy, permitting study, selection, and manipulation of how microorganisms acquire nutrients from their surroundings. Finally, radiation may increase microbial mutation rates during the flight, leading to the potential adaptation and coevolution of the microbial community. 
Thus, it is promising to use the unique condition of the International Space Station National Lab to incubate and cultivate strains of microorganisms with beneficial capabilities. In order to do that, our automatic programmable culture payload will proceed with the pre-programmed experiment once in orbit, in which we limit carbon source in the growth medium, providing selective pressure for evolution towards activity and growth of the microbe that degrades the PET more efficiently. Currently, we are working on the first iteration of the experiment that is scheduled to launch on board SpaceX 25 inside the NanoRack black box, in which a single string will be tested out both for the hardware and our in-orbit operation in a full hands-off setup. We already identified our optimal in-orbit logistics and the potential risks such as failures of the hardware and unsuccessful preservation of the biological samples pre- and post-flight. However, with our current work as the technology demonstration, we will have the expertise for handling the risk. More importantly, our prayer work with Unreal on the enzyme and microbes, and our collaboration with Chris Sanders Lab in Harvard, Seed Health Research Lab, and Professor Christopher Mason in Cornell to ensure the success of the project. And after the flight, we will be measuring the biodegradation results through physical analysis and chemical analysis. We are looking at quantitative genomic metabolic, and proteomic analysis to understand the microbe adaptation and biodegradation pathways. There are multiple outcomes and benefits for the project. For the scientific and technical benefits, quantitative genomic, metabolic, and proteomic analysis will lead to the understanding of microbial adaptation, biodegradation, and upcycling pathway through high-quality validated genome scale models. For the economic and commercial benefits, the global market for plastic recycling is projected to reach 47.3 billion US dollar by 2026. The upcycling process in this mission create valuable products from PET and ultimately incentivize higher reclamation rate at scale. Through our partnership with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL, an MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem, the technology developed in this project could translate to sustainable market and commercialization. For the social and humankind benefit, a higher yield in upcycling process will create a circular economy that extends the functional lifespan of molecules to make plastic and reduce waste. Finally, for the STEM benefits, we plan to create public exhibitions for the project, as well as using social media outreach, leveraging MIT resources to generate interest in space research and raise awareness for sustainable development in schools and public. Here is our cost estimate and our schedule. We are very much looking forward for the support from ISS National Laboratory. Thank you so much. Hope that you found that pitch to be intriguing. And again, it hopefully gives the general public an idea of how researchers are proposing science on the ISS. Now, I'd like to shift to our featured fireside chat. When we were thinking of hosting this event, we wanted to invite a member of the science journalist community to facilitate this conversation. Ashley Stricken with CNN is someone who is no stranger to reporting on science taking place on the orbiting laboratory and was a perfect person to lead this important conversation. Ashley has been with CNN for more than 10 years and in addition to covering space announcements, also writes about health and wellness. We are incredibly fortunate to have Ashley join us for this event and with that, Ashley, please take it away. Thanks, Patrick. It's wonderful to be here and support two very important conversations today. As Patrick mentioned, I've had the privilege to write extensively about research taking place on the International Space Station. The orbiting laboratory has served as an incredible test bed for a multitude of concepts and experiments that just aren't possible on Earth. I'm excited to have the opportunity to participate in these conversations today and learn about how the space station can support research that can improve our planet's environment. You could say I gravitated to it. So this afternoon, we'll have two sets of conversations. Our first session will be a fireside chat that will include four very talented women, all coming from diverse backgrounds. The purpose of this conversation is to highlight how the ISS National Lab is prioritizing sustainability-related research in low Earth orbit. Also, over the years, the ISS National Lab has partnered with a variety of organizations to fund research in space. Some of them are traditional entities like the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation. But last year, the ISS National Lab partnered with Estee Lauder to fund research through a sustainability challenge focused on plastics alternatives. We'll dig a little deeper into why a company like Estee Lauder would have interest in funding research that will launch to the ISS. We will also have subject matter experts to discuss the impacts of plastic pollution on our environment and how companies are becoming much more conscious of environmentally friendly ways 
to find plastics alternatives. It's now my honor, our honor to introduce our panelists. Today, we are joined by Christine Kretz, the Vice President of Innovation Programs and Partnerships for ISS National Lab, Stephanie Spodek, Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Estee Lauder, Erin McCluskey, Managing Director for the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network, and Karen Hagerman, who serves as the Director for the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. So Christine, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. So the ISS National Lab has worked alongside a variety of unique commercial companies over the years for research and development on the space station. But how did this relationship with Estee Lauder come about? Well, Stephanie and I were introduced by some people at NASA because uh, Estee Lauder was working on a different project with NASA at the time. And when we started talking, sustainability came up immediately in our conversation. And I was really excited to hear about all the things that Estee Lauder was doing to improve their footprint, to uh, you know, make more sustainable products. And, and so we decided to get together in New York. We met up. Um, we chatted together about the idea of their joining us for a sustainability challenge, and they were really in from the beginning. So it's been a great pleasure to work with their whole team because they're really just truly on board with this, this challenge effort. So what is it about the space station that has your team thinking that sustainability-related research and development is an enticing area to target for potential research partners? Well, as you know, the, um, the ISS, the International Space Station, is really a one-of-a-kind laboratory. And it's out there in microgravity, floating in space, and providing some, some interesting kinds of, of lab opportunities that are just not available on Earth. One of them is microgravity. And there have been a number of projects in, in advanced materials prior to this that have shown some excellent uses of the microgravity in changes to the molecular content size of crystals, development of, of products. So we did um, a round table at one of our conferences. We worked on some ideas with experts in the field of sustainability, and we created a white paper that launched this idea about how we could leverage it and really see if we could make some inroads, especially in reduction of plastics or changing plastic formulation. So this came out of um, a group of people who are passionate about sustainability and, and people who are passionate about how we can best use the International Space Station for research. And I wanted to kind of follow up on that and why you think the space station is the perfect setting for challenges geared towards things like plastic alternatives or other ideas and concepts in the future? Well, we've done so many uh, projects on the space station to date in, in the 11 years since the beginning of the um, National Lab, and about 50% of them are with um, uh, partners that are non-academic, industry partners, private, private industry, and they've had some really interesting findings in areas ranging from uh, pharmaceutical research to new kinds of materials to 3D printers. All of those things then lend themselves to ideas that can move us into a new kind of advanced uh, material in plastics. And are there other collaborations that ISS National Lab has sponsored that are focused on sustainability or you could see happening in the future? Well, we have uh, recently launched the last project from a Target Cotton Sustainability Challenge that we started a few years ago. In cotton sustainability, the use of water and drought is really part of uh, cotton uh, crops and, and they've selected three projects that have been running over the last years. The last of those projects launched on SpaceX 24 and we were really excited about the findings from that in, in the short time that they, they've been doing that just since December. They've already come back with some developments from that work and, and we do hope to further that work with Target. That's great. And do you expect partnerships where companies are funding science and space will continue to be an enticing model to further research demand? Um, I do, and we've done other kinds of private work. Uh, we work with Boeing, for example, in mass challenge with accelerators and startups to define projects. We've got over 20 projects that Boeing has jointly funded with us over the years as an example. And they really bring us some new kinds of insights for these startups, for these companies, even the academics working with us in new areas. 
And it brings our partners like Estee Lauder, like Target and like Boeing to the table with these innovative uh, organizations. So it gives people that we're working with a front row seat. An example is that we update Target every six months about the, the uh, um, capabilities and what's happening in the results. We'll be doing the same with SD Louder, and we hope other companies want a seat at the table. Um, and we are looking forward to do another sustainability challenge in 2023. So we're happy to have companies who'd like that front row seat to, to let us know. We'd love to have them join us. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And as we all saw recently, the ISS has been extended through 2030. Uh, so for you and your organization, you know, what does that mean and what will be kind of the key focus areas for the ISS National Lab as we move forward? Well, we are getting more focused on things that become product and become something that can be used on Earth. So our target areas are in space production and tech dev, along with some fundamental science that leads us toward new insights. It's fantastic that we've got more time with that really valuable laboratory in space. And what we're excited about is continuing to advance the needs and the commercial ideas while that station is there as we get ready to advance to the next set of stations, there may be many, so that we're prepared for those new stations, we're prepared for exploration, and we're really getting advantage that people here on Earth can see um, things that have come from that that have really brought results. Well, thank you, Christine. I really appreciate you sharing your perspective, and it's, it's great to hear about all of that. Uh, and Stephanie, I'd like to turn to you next and get your perspective on, on what led Estee Lauder to partner on a sustainability research initiative for plastic alternatives. Sure. So first, I just want to say hi to everyone. It's so lovely to be here with all of you today. And thank you to the ISS National Lab for inviting us. At Estee Lauder, we believe in innovation with a focus on sustainability. And as a leader in the beauty industry, it's our responsibility to push boundaries of innovation. We are on a long-term journey to become more sustainable, and we are really proud to support ISS and their mission to discover plastic alternatives. It's something that's hugely important for the whole planet, not just Estee Lauder. At Estee Lauder companies, we have committed and taken action to have at least 80% of our packaging be recyclable, refillable, reusable, recycled, or recoverable by 2025. So that leads to how we got here today. As Christine mentioned, Christine had connected with me and she brought to my attention the idea of the sustainability hackathon. It was actually very timely because in addition to our own ongoing focus on sustainability, we were also exploring innovative ways to really make a bigger impact. So I called my boss at the time, who is now group president at Estee Lauder Companies, to pitch the idea of, to him of us partnering with ISS, and he said, let's do it. And it really was the most perfect fit and one of the programs I'm most proud of. Science and innovation are a huge part of who and what we are as a brand. And it goes back to our founder, Mrs. Estee Lauder, who was a true trailblazer and someone who always pushed the boundaries of innovation. So being able to partner on this and being able to take innovation to another level where we can have even more of an impact was really meaningful to all of us. Well, that's so nice to hear. And, and I know because you're working with the National Lab to support this research into plastics alternatives, um, this is being led and developed by external scientists. So how do you hope to leverage the insights derived from this research? And are there plans to implement the findings uh, into your product packaging eventually? So first, we hope that the selected proposal performs successfully and it yields positive results with tangible benefits for the entire planet. When it comes to how we would leverage the insights and implement results, our hope is that the research will ultimately help lead to the development of a broad use biopolymer or plastic alternative that could be translated to many industries, including the beauty industry, but also beyond. 
And can you share with us other ways that Estee Lauder continues to advance its sustainable packaging efforts? Sure. So our ambition is to have 100% forest-based fiber cartons, FSC certified by 2025. And by 2030, reduce the amount of virgin petroleum-based plastic in our packaging by 50% or less. And we actually have some great examples of how we have started to work towards these goals. Um, this spring, we launched new moisturizers and compacts and fragrance that are packed in more responsible, refillable packages. And one of the launches, for example, our moisturizer, Revitalizing Supreme Plus, is in a new recyclable glass jar, helping us to reduce up to 375,000 pounds of plastic six and a half million gallons of waste and 3.7 million kilograms of CO2 emissions. And one more question for you, and, and this is something very near and dear to my heart as I'm sure it is yours. Uh, Estee Lauder has been at the forefront of supporting and advancing women. And so do you see that reinforced with this partnership? Absolutely, yes. Today, women constitute 82% of Estee Lauder Company's global workforce. 55% of senior positions are held by women, and almost half of the company's board of directors are women. Estee Lauder was founded by a woman for women, and developing and investing in women leaders builds on Mrs. Estee Lauder's legacy. So we really strive to empower women at all levels of the company, wherever they work, whether it's STEM, manufacturing, corporate, or retail. So women's empowerment is really part of our brand's DNA, and it's extremely important for us, and it was a major factor when starting our partnership with ISS. So when the challenge was announced, we both agreed it was important to solicit proposals from diverse audiences including female scientist forum, forums, such as Women Defying Gravity. And we're really excited to see that many of the investigations are led by women researchers. That is so wonderful to hear. And Stephanie, thank you so much for taking me through all of that. Uh, and this has been such a great conversation so far, but we're actually gonna take a little break and send it back to Patrick for a special announcement right now. Thank you so much, Ashley. Hope that you all have enjoyed the first part of our fireside chat. And now for the second of our pitch finalist videos. Hello, cases judges, and welcome to our pitch. My name is Dr. Katrina Knauer, and I am the PI for the project No Carbon Left Behind. I'm a polymer scientist at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, and the chief technology officer of the Bio-Optimized Technologies to Keep Thermoplastics Out of Landfills and the Environment, or Bottle Consortium. We have an amazing team of scientists on this project, including our implementation partner, Olivia gomez Hozas, the Chief Executive Officer of Rhodium Scientific, a Hispanic female-led organization with extensive experience in space biomanufacturing. The vision for this project is to enable a greater than 85% conversion and a 10x economic valorization of mixed plastic wastes that are not currently recycled and rejected by material reclamation facilities or MRFs. Current recycling technologies require advanced sortation of the waste into highly pure streams, and this results in a significant amount of plastic waste rejected by MRFs and sent to landfill. Our proposed technology will eliminate the need for advanced sortation and allow for highly heterogeneous waste streams to be converted into one single product. To accomplish this vision, our project goal is to develop a viable catalytic deconstruction and biological upcycling process which we believe will be enabled by microgravity conditions on the ISS to convert mixed plastic waste to highly valuable biopolymers called polyhydroxyalkanoates or PHAs that are already commercially used as biodegradable plastic packaging today. The proposed project will address all three goals outlined in the ISS sustainability challenge and was motivated by previous work done in the bottle consortium. We have demonstrated a successful case study using mixed plastic streams of polyethylene, polystyrene, and polyethylene terephthalate with up to 65% yields in bioproducts. But our engineer microbial strains have hit a wall and we can't seem to push the carbon efficiency any further. So at this stage, we really need space and the ISS to truly push this technology to the next level. 
and we hypothesize that the effects of microgravity can yield microbial strains with improved metabolism and carbon efficiency that can be harnessed and replicated on Earth. We need the help of the ISS to achieve this vision and the use of an advanced laboratory in microgravity conditions. Additionally, previous ISS work conducted by our implementation partner, Rhodium Scientific, suggests that exposure to spaceflight conditions can generate microorganism strains with improved metabolism for PHA production. So we believe that utilizing these conditions on the ISS, we can develop new biodegradable polymers from otherwise non-circular plastic feedstocks. Our proposed project will progress as follows. The oxidative deconstruction of mixed plastics will be carried out terrestrially in the bottle labs at NREL using our patented process. The oxygenated intermediates will be loaded and frozen in rhodium culture bag hardware for integration into the rhodium science chamber facility. Engineer microbial cell cultures will be co-integrated into the culture bags using proprietary techniques that will avoid on-orbit pipetting operations that could introduce contamination and safety risks to the astronauts. Samples will be transported to the ISS for incubation under microgravity, most likely using the Sable incubator. And then following incubation, samples will be immediately frozen in the Melfi and remain frozen for return to Earth. Upon return to Earth, samples will be transferred to the bottle labs at NREL and cell population, protein structures, and bioproducts will be characterized and compared to terrestrial experiments. If PHA yields prove to be superior, the cell population will be harnessed for living foundries and replicated to potentially scale the process using the NREL pilot plant. After demonstrating a successful pilot run, Bottle and Rhodium will work together to identify an appropriate commercialization partner in the plastic supply chain. Our proposed technology will overcome challenges in heterogeneity of plastic waste by upgrading real world mixed plastic waste with yield improvement and cost reduction strategies. We believe this unique combination of innovations in chemistry, biology, and spaceflight will truly push this technology to the highest carbon efficiency possible to achieve carbon circularity for plastics. The targeted PHA products are highly valuable, market-relevant plastics already used for biodegradable plastic packaging. So if successful, this project would substantially advance the state of the art toward commercial relevance and provide a technology for piloting and scale-up development. The proposed project will be carried out over 18 months. We are requesting a total of 468,000 in funding from CASIS with 168,000 of funding in kind provided by Bottle and Rhodium. Additionally, NREL will cover the cost of a pilot run, which is approximately 300,000 per batch. Thank you so much for your time and consideration, and we hope you will select our project to progress to the next round in the challenge. Hope that you enjoyed that pitch. And now, Ashley, please, for the second portion of your fireside chat, take it away. Thanks, Patrick. And now we'll get back to our conversation. And I'd like to turn the questions over now to Aaron. Uh, so what are some of the main focus areas for the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, yeah, just to give some background, the uh, Ocean Plastics Leadership Network, we are a, a network of uh, about 120 organizations. Um, uh, ranging from Greenpeace to Dow, so really just the full spectrum of, of people working towards um, a plastic uh, pollution-free world. And, and so to give you a little context on, on, on our plans for 2022, I just want to take us back to 2021 when Greenpeace and WWF asked us to convene our network um, around a global plastics treaty. So uh, the UN had been, dis been discussing the possibility of, of negotiating a treaty um, to fight plastic pollution. And, and so we started to convene our stakeholders uh, from civil society, academia, um, companies, uh, you know, waste pickers, uh, to start to talk about what we would want to see in such a treaty, such a global agreement. And so um, we started that, that process last March, and we're so excited to say that at UNEA, the U UN Environmental Assembly in Nairobi two weeks ago, the UN voted to start negotiations on such an agreement. So it's really exciting, and it's really just kind of set the trajectory um, for our organization and our network moving forward, 2022 and beyond, uh, you know, and looking at, at how we're really tracking along with the negotiation process um, and bringing you know the our stakeholders together to to have difficult conversations around how we're going to tackle this at a global level um, given that the our network is full of global companies and global organizations 
Uh, and so we're going to continue to convene at that level. But what we're most excited about is uh, is uh, our, we're, we've been also convening at a national level. So going into countries um, who who have to deal with how they're, you know, the actual, uh, like how the rubber meets the road and they're, how they're going to actually tackle um, plastic pollution in their countries and, and having similar convenings uh, with a variety of stakeholders around how, what a national action plan might look like and, and how they might meet the, the targets set by the global treaty. And so that's what we're most excited about is, is starting to roll out our programming in, in different countries. We're in seven right now um, and with a goal to be in 50 uh, because we know that, you know, we learned from the Paris Agreement that we can have these global ambitions, but when it comes to actually implementing solutions, countries are going to need the support and they're going to need the plans to make it happen. And so we want to have, have, like start that conversation and, the, and creating those plans now. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and just really excited about this new mandate at the UN because I think it's going to mobilize a lot of action. No, absolutely. And <clears throat> thank you so much for sharing that great news. It's, it's so wonderful to hear. And obviously, one of the reasons we're here today, we're highlighting how companies like Estee Lauder are supporting these, this third party research in new and novel ways. So in your eyes, you know, what have you seen from companies that are stepping up to combat the issues that seek to end the flow of plastics into our oceans? Yeah, I think what's been really exciting to see is how companies are now kind of stepping out of their silos and starting to collaborate with actors across the system. And that is what is going to be needed to actually see a circular economy, you know, come to fruition is, is companies supporting innovation um, and, and actually collaborating with other companies and sharing, you know, best practices and sharing, like, how can we tackle this, this problem together? Um, and a lot of the work that we do is based in this report called Breaking the Plastic Wave that was put out by Pew um, and, and Systemic. And that report really looks at how are we gonna tackle this? Like it's a huge problem, plastic production is only increasing. We need to scale up all solutions fast and companies have a very important role in stimulating that important innovation and research that is like incredibly needed um, to to propel us into this more, more circular economy. We're gonna need uh, innovations in alternative materials. We're gonna need innovations in how systems are run, um, how reuse refill systems are actually implemented. Uh, that's gonna take a lot of coordination across um, governments, companies, uh, you know, municipalities. And so companies have a really like, crucial role to play. And, and just the way that they've been showing up lately in these spaces has been really encouraging and I think, even you know the very kind of progressive green pieces of the world that break free from plastics are seeing that from from certain companies and they're acknowledging that like hey we might not be as far apart as we used to be on these issues um, how can we continue to work together to make positive change and with what you've outlined it sounds like there could be challenges along the way and so if you could you know what are some of the biggest challenges that you see moving forward with regards to plastic in the oceans, um, but also just, you know, pollution in, in our world in general? Yeah, I think, you know, living in the U.S., our waste is kind of out of sight, out of mind a, a lot, you know, and we, sh one of the things that we, that we do as a developed uh, country is we ship a lot of our waste um, to countries that don't have the capacity or ability to actually deal with it. Uh, and so a lot of the, the pollution that we see leaks into the ocean from those countries. And it's not because they're producing that plastic, it's because they're receiving a lot more than they can account for. Um, and and that it inevitably leaks into our environment. Uh, and so it's, I think it's a few things. I think it's acknowledging um, that developed, countries have a role to play in, in managing uh, waste and, and also companies and, and producers who do produce products and sell in, into certain markets, they need to ensure that those markets actually have the ability to recycle that product. You know, like when, when 
a product is re released into the world, it's not released into a vacuum, right? It, it has to live in the system. And, and so living in that system, we have to look at, does that system have the capability to manage this, this waste or can we turn that waste into you know, a more circular product where we can reuse it, where we can, um, where the material is less toxic, uh, you know, has better impacts on our environment. Uh, and so I think it's, it's really uh, coming to terms with the fact that we just can't keep producing as much plastic as, as we have been. And we need to, you know, be in better global coordination and how we manage that waste. No, absolutely. So what does it mean to Ocean Plastics Leadership Network to know that there is a platform like the ISS that can enable research that could positively impact society and our planet as well? Yeah, and as I was kind of saying earlier, we need to scale up all solutions um, as fast as possible. And I think platforms like what the ISS has provided, it, it almost provides a, a inspirational point for people to, to invest in that research to, uh, you know, see what is possible um, and like really dream big. And another thing that I was thinking about is they really actually have a worldview on these challenges. You know, what they can see plastic pollution play out, um, like actually play out in the world and in the oceans. Um, and they can also see, you know, the effects of other environmental uh, problems uh, in the world as well. And so, and those things are interrelated, right? If we, if we decide to use more of one material, um, you know, maybe less plastic and more of, of uh, forest-based or tree-based products, what is the effect on, on that kind of uh, resource, right? They can kind of map that um, as, it, as it plays out. Uh, and so it's it's a really important, I think they hold a really important platform that that kind of brings these different elements together um, while sparking kind of innovation. I think that the sparking of the innovation is gonna be crucial um, if we're going to kind of dream bigger than the problem. Um, and so that's it's just been really inspiring to see uh, and from this platform. And I'm really, really honored to be here and and, and speaking with you all. Well, Erin, thank you so much for sharing your insight. It's so great to hear that. And Karen, I would love to turn to you now and ask you some questions. Uh, so could you please tell us a little bit more about the mission of Sustainable Packaging Coalition? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ashley. And I just want to echo what Erin just said. It's an honor to be here and on, on this panel with all three of these women. It's fantastic to hear all of the activity that's happening in this space. Um, so the Sustainable Packaging Coalition is an initiative of the nonprofit Green Blue, which is uh, an environmental nonprofit focused on the sustainable use of materials in society. Um, but with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, we specifically focus on packaging, as you could guess. Um, and it's a membership-based collaborative where we bring together stakeholders from throughout the packaging value chain to work towards more sustainable packaging. Um, we really really uh, get to work at kind of the nexus of the value chain. We work with brands, retailers, packaging converters, material manufacturers and suppliers, and government and academic members as well. So we bring these stakeholders together and work towards creating packaging that's good for both people and for the environment. Um, our mission really is to catalyze action through these stakeholders to create packaging systems uh, that are improved and sustainable, and then also provide an authoritative voice on issues related to packaging sustainability. Well, it's great to hear how you bring people together. And I have to say, you have such an interesting background, first as a Naval Academy graduate, and then as a helicopter pilot in the Marine Corps. And that's quite a transition that you've made uh, moving to Sustainable Packaging Coalition. So I'm just curious, you know, how did this change come about? Yes, uh, so I, I did attend the Naval Academy for college and um, I actually majored in the Astro track of aerospace engineering. So I studied satellites, uh, spacecraft, orbital mechanics, all of that. So this conversation is really exciting for me to kind of bring together some of my interests. Um, I also had the opportunity to intern with NASA in Houston in school, which was an incredible experience. Um, and I was really interested in space when I was younger, but my personal passions have, have kind of um, changed, shifted, and the trajectory that I've been on changed as well since then. 
Um, and a big part of it was my experience throughout my career in the Marine Corps. I was commissioned into the Marine Corps and trained to be a helicopter pilot, which was also a fantastic, um, incredible, challenging experience. But during that time, I was really fortunate to live on five different beaches and spend time overseas and just see different parts of the world. Um, and as my love of the ocean grew, my awareness of the issues facing it uh, was just, it, it, it kind of hit me really hard. And I really started to realize uh, where my passions were and what I wanted to do. Um, I started noticing on the beaches I lived on more trash, a lot of that plastic, most of that packaging. And so I knew that I wanted to be part of changing that situation, working towards a solution. Um, and I knew also that the, the solution wasn't cleaning up that plastic alone. It wasn't cleaning up the trash. It had, it, it started back into, you know, how it's produced, what those decisions are, how it gets disseminated. So it's really a systems issue and understanding that we need to work to change the system. So with all that, I decided to uh, leave the Marine Corps to pursue that passion. And I went back to school to study sustainable engineering, where I focused on conducting a systems level assessment of the plastics recycling value chain and infrastructure. Um, and that work led me to Green Blue and to the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, uh, where I really get to engage with all the members, the stakeholders of the system and learn and work with others who are, are working to change the system. Well, it's quite a journey and, and it's so great to, to hear about how, how you've tied all these things that you're so interested in together. And, and I noticed that your coalition works with a variety of recognizable companies to enact change and how we improve processes uh, and the packaging industries for the benefit of our planet. So what are some of the biggest trends uh, or even challenges that you've seen in collaborating with some of the largest companies in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, like our, our vantage point is really exciting because we do get to work with so many leading edge companies from multinational consumer brands to small businesses, but also the packaging converters who make the packages for the brands and the material suppliers that provide that. Um, we have members like Estee Lauder who are working towards these really great solutions and just getting to understand what everyone's doing, being able to connect those dots throughout the supply chain. We do get to understand um, and learn about and help to work towards addressing some of those challenges as well as the opportunities. I think when you, when we talk about the challenges in this space, packaging has always been a really innovative space. We don't always recognize it when we have a product in our hands, but there's so much engineering that has gone into developing that particular package for that particular application. But a consequence of that is the pace of innovation has really outpaced the development of things like recycling infrastructure or end of life management for those products. Um, so I think the biggest trends, and, and Stephanie hit on this with talking about SEO Lauder's goals, really working towards recyclability, compostability, and reuse or refill models. Those are, are really, um, really big focus points for companies in this space. And that not only means innovative materials for the recyclability and compostability, but also innovative manufacturing processes, or in the case of reuse, entirely new business models to help address the end of life. Uh, but the biggest challenge is, as I hinted at with that, is infrastructure to support all of those. Um, and also I'd say we tend to focus a lot on, on the end of life of material, but when you think about packaging sustainability, end of life is only one piece of the puzzle. We look at sourcing, optimizing packaging, and also the material health. So how the chemicals that are in packaging impact human health and the environment. And so there's a lot of emerging, emerging areas where companies are starting to realize that it's this entire life cycle and all the different pieces around it that we need to address uh, in order to really make packaging more sustainable. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, when you were invited to this event talking about space-based research, I'm curious, you know, what were your initial thoughts and, and how have you thought about the space station previously as a platform to support uh, this kind of research and, and efforts to improve our planet? I, yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, when I heard about this and learned more about what the ISS is doing, what the partnership with SA Lauder is, I think it's fantastic. The issues that we're facing today, whether it's ocean pollution, like we're referring or talking to, also climate change, resource scarcity, 
these are really big issues and they require entire systems to change. So I think we need as much research, as much brain power, as much effort as possible to really, you know, even, even make a dent in this, um, let alone figure out and get to the sustainable future we want to be at. So knowing that there are resources like the ISS is really encouraging. And on a personal level, I've, I read a lot of science fiction and there's a lot of books that are set in space stations or spacecraft. Um, and they've really emphasized the closed system that a spacecraft is uh, and, and understanding, you know, whether it's like oxygen scrubbers, water recycl recyclers, that that's a sustainable system. So there's so much we can learn from the sustainable system that is the ISS. Um, and I think, especially when we think of it as where uh, on the space station, the barrier between livable and unlivable, you know, a metal wall where on the planet, there's still that barrier between livable and unlivable, but it's it's miles of atmosphere and we don't necessarily have the same sense of urgency. But when it comes down to it, it really is the same situation that we're in. And so I think there's so much we can learn from the research, the experience of the space station that we can apply to living within a sustainable earth and reaching that really um, circular future that we that we need. Oh, definitely. And, and that's such a great way to look at it. And uh, you know, looking ahead, what are some of those long range goals that you have for Sustainable Packaging Coalition? And, and do you envision that the space station could help to provide insights that, uh, that further these unique collaborations or science that benefits our planet? Yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to long term goals, the, the vision that the SPC has is really a world where packaging is Source responsibly, recovered effectively, optimized for efficiency, non-toxic, and also low impact. And that to make that an ideal reality is we still have a long way to go. And one of the pieces of that is really understanding that there's so many trade-offs. And I think Aaron mentioned it that, you know, with the, the space station looking at at the change, maybe if we're shifting to fiber-based products, what does that mean for deforestation? So really understanding the, the trade-offs within the system and for us being able to provide guidance to companies on how we can really optimize the packaging for the right application that has the least impacts. Um, a lot of that requires data. It requires actual understanding of, of the entire life cycle in, in the footprint of the product or packaging. And so the more data, the more research we have, I think can, can really enable us to make those better recommendations and guidance to companies to really ensure that the product they're putting out on the market um, or the way that they're developing a reuse or refill system is, is the most sustainable option. And that, that takes a lot of this research. So I think uh, there's so much that can be learned with a facility that has the, um, the capabilities of the space station to, to be able to partner and, and understand how we can get to that ideal that ideal place that we're working towards. No, that's that is such an that's a really important point to make, and and I just want to thank all of you so much for joining us for this insightful conversation. It's incredible to hear how each of you are working on different aspects that come together, bring people and concepts and initiatives together. And so I just, I really appreciate all of you joining us. It was such a fantastic conversation here with our four female panelists. Um, and, and speaking of insight and perspective, uh, we're now going to hear from someone who has spent more than 200 days living and working on the International Space Station. And he's also the author of How to Astronaut, which is a wonderful book that can answer just about any question that you have about life in zero gravity. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Terry Virts. He was selected as a NASA astronaut in 2000. He has a unique experience of flying not only on the space shuttle, but also a Russian Soyuz vehicle. And prior to joining the NASA astronaut corps, he was a decorated Air Force pilot and served as a test pilot and reached the rank of Colonel. Uh, Terry, it's wonderful to have you join us today. So nice to see you. And, uh, and I just wanted to, to ask you the question I'm sure you've heard so many times from so many people. Uh, but what was it like for you to to live and work in space? Well, thanks, Ashley, for having me. What a cool panel. And uh, that is a question I've heard a few times before. Um, and it was, uh, at the, the bottom line is it was the culmination of a dream come true. It's something I wanted to do my whole life. As a boy, I grew up with pictures and posters of space on, my, on the wall of my room. And uh, having a chance to go into space was 
you know, what I wanted to do my whole life. The first and most overwhelming thing about getting into space, when they shut the engines down, you're floating. And that feels like you're falling because that's actually what's happening. You're falling. Um, there's still gravity, even at a couple hundred miles above the earth in orbit. Uh, and as you fall, you move forward really fast. You're going about five miles or eight kilometers a second. So this combination of falling and moving forward puts you in orbit. And so your body feels like that. And the first two days I had the worst headache of my life. Um, it eventually got better. Uh, it was like a light switch on the third morning that I was in space. And then I was fine the whole rest of my two week mission at the time that was a two week shuttle flight. And interestingly, when I went back um, about four or five years later on a Russian Soyuz the second time, I was fine from day one. So my brain got rewired. It figured out what weightlessness was. But there's definitely a learning curve. There's a very steep learning curve that takes a few weeks before you're really good at getting to move around, which is not like walking on Earth, and also just keeping track of stuff. It's really hard to, to work in space. They say that everything's harder in space. Um, that's almost true, except for pull-ups. Pull-ups are easier, but everything else is more difficult in space. I can imagine. And uh, obviously we've been talking about research on the space station. And I wanted to know what was some of the, the cool science that you had an opportunity to participate in during your time on the space station? So that was one of my favorite things to do. I'm just a fighter pilot, I'm not a scientist, but on my most recent flight, we had over 250 experiments. Um, anything that you can study on earth, uh, biology. I was a guinea pig. I did a lot of medical experiments on my own body. Um, combustion science, physics. There's a really cool astronomy experiment called AMS2 that's a particle detector. It's trying to figure out what the universe is made of. Um, a material science experiment. Um, in a, we have this thing called a glove box. A lot of labs down on earth have glove boxes. Scientists can work on stuff and then if it leaks, it stays inside the glove box. And I did an interesting materials, several different material science. Um, probably the most valuable was something called rodent research. On my particular mission, we were working on bone and muscle drugs, a big, large pharmaceutical company sponsored that. And that's really the story of science. It's, it's either companies that sponsor the science that we do or research organizations, um, universities or other research organizations. But it's not a lot of it comes through grant money from NASA and space agencies. But at the end of the day, NASA is not usually the scientist. The scientist usually comes from companies or universities or other organizations like that. No, absolutely. And, and something else I know that you were really interested in doing while you were in space, uh, you were famous for your love of photography and you were very immersed in taking images. And I wanted to ask, you know, why did that speak to you and, and why was that of so much interest for you? I grew up, my, when I was a little kid, my, my parents got me a Konica SLR camera that you had to put the film in. So I just grew up with photography. I had to teach myself. Nobody really knew anything about photography. I had to learn about exposure and aperture and focus and all that. Um, and so I'm the kind of dad, the kids are like, dad, stop taking pictures. Um, I'm just a camera guy. And I was very lucky on, one day when I was in training for my last flight, um, on my Outlook, I looked at my phone and it said, go to building nine for IMAX training. And I was very excited and it turned out I had a chance to help make an IMAX movie. It was actually the last um, made in space IMAX film called A Beautiful Planet. Tony Myers had been involved with the very first IMAX film back in the day, Columbia, the very first space IMAX film. So she was our director. She was also my mentor because filmmaking is something that I kind of love. And I got to direct a documentary two years ago and that's kind of what I want to do in the future. So that was an amazing experience because of all the science that I did in space. And some of it was very important, but very few people ever, unless you're a PhD nerd in that specific area, most people are not going to know about what is happening on these science experiments, but a movie like beautiful planet, you know, millions of people, we, we premiered it at the air and space museum in New York or in uh, Washington. And the director there said, Hey, you know, millions of people are going to see this. So that was, to me, it was really important because it brings the experience of spaceflight back to humans down here on Earth. 
And I have to say too that um, this is something I'm, I'm sure that you've been asked a lot about, but it's it's something that I think is so intriguing to so many people. As an astronaut, you get to experience the overview effect. You get to see our planet as an actual planet. And so I'm I'm curious, you know, what are kind of the effects for you when you get to see our world from this unique vantage point? I've been thinking about this a lot recently because of the war going on and and you know what I've learned and what others have learned and what others have not learned by looking back and seeing the planet. Um, it's I used to say it affected me in that I'm less of a black and white guy. I'm a lot more there's shades of gray, you know, things. That, that's not true about everything. Some things are black and white, but I can see kind of both sides of the issue. And, and what the way it really affected me is that I can, I think, better than I could before, really look at something from an unbiased perspective. Like I can not be biased by tribe, which so many of us are, and we're seeing this play out in this horrendous conflict in Ukraine. You can, I can kind of step back and go, nope, that's wrong. I can criticize America made this mistake. America is doing this well. And that's an ability that I think we need more of, to say the least, um, on the planet. The ability to step back and, and, op and really try and see things for what they really are. Um, I remember one day looking at, at the Earth and I thought, man, that thing's been around for a long time. The planet's been around for billions of years. It's going to be around for billions of years. We're just not here for very long. And a lot of people think, they're very important, you know, celebrities are worshipped around the world. It's really hard to get into celebrities after you've seen the planet from space, to be honest. Um, some of them are great. Some of them do amazing things, but it's because, you know what I mean? It's, it's not because of the fact that they're a celebrity. And the other thing, there's a really thin blue line. I've got different pictures. Uh, there's my book right there. You can sort of see it. Like that blue line is really, 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 really thin. And there are no other planets that we can ever live on. There's only Earth. Um, there's no other planet in the solar system that humans will ever be able to live on without a spaceship or a spacesuit. Um, there may be planets around other stars. Those stars are really, 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 really far away, and we're not going to get there anytime soon. So we have Earth, um, and that's it. So that, that those there's a lot of things that I've been thinking about, like I said, a lot recently. But those are some of the some of the big ones. You're right. You know there is no planet B, and um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask you more about a beautiful planet because it it truly is just incredible. Um, you know when you were working on that and and you were incorporating things in there about pushing towards a better understanding of our planet and taking better care of it. Um, what what did you think and feel about that? And when you came back. To Earth, what was kind of your perspective on taking care of the planet and, and being able to see changes, you know, from, from more than 220 miles above the world? So Tony's wanted to make a movie about the environment, and it's not an environmental movie, it's about the, the fun of space flight, and the, a part of it is about humans living in space, and that's really cool, but a big part of it is about the planet and the environment. And Tony's big vision and unfortunately she passed away from cancer a couple of years ago but her vision for the world really is nuclear fusion she sees it as nuclear fusion is kind of the answer in the long run if we can make that work and i i believe that we should be doing our next moonshot sh shouldn't be the moon it should be to get energy like nuclear fusion and hydrogen working down here on earth um and th there's a couple problems that i saw with the environment from space but I'll say that one of my requests to Tony, I said, Tony, I don't want to make a doom and gloom. We're all going to die movie. There's plenty of those and those just don't work. They preach to the choir. There's an environmental crowd that already knows all these problems. And so um, she added a scene in there about the Chesapeake Bay and how, which is where I'm from, um, near the right across the street from the Naval Academy. Um, in the 70s, it was a mess. All the pollution we had, it was just a mess. We cleaned it up. And it's an example of, you know, you can make some tough decisions and you can fix things. So problems are not done forever. The two big environmental problems that I saw from space were pollution, especially over China. Um, China's a disaster. It, it's, if you've ever been to Beijing, when you land, it's like you're landing at Mars. It's just yellow and brown outside from all of the pollution. 
Now, they brought hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty, which is really good, but it's also come at a cost of pollution. So we need to figure out how to make that energy without all that pollution for lots of reasons. The other big thing that's a real tragedy, and <clears throat> you know, climate change is not forever. It'll be around for a few centuries and then it'll be gone. We're not making any more dinosaurs. So, you know, that's a problem that only lasts a couple centuries. It's terrible. We don't, we want to minimize it, but it's not forever. The thing that is forever is extinction. And one of the things that you can see from, I saw from space is deforestation in the Amazon, which is horrendous. That's really bad for both climate change and also extinction. There's a lot of species that are going extinct because of what, what's happening <clears throat> today in, in Brazil. The Washington Post had an article today that was really sad and tragic about the deforestation in the Brazil. So most of the planet is a beautiful planet. I, my, the problem, I always joke, the problem with being an astronaut is your bucket list gets too long. <laughs> but the, you know, pollution is an issue. We need to stop polluting as much as we do. And deforestation is a real serious issue. The, the world, that's a problem the world's not focused on. And it affects us all. What happens in Brazil and the Amazon affects us all. So those are two of the environmental problems that I think are the biggest ones. No, and those are such good points to raise. And, and so when you hear about ISS National Lab, you know, forging partnerships with companies like Estee Lauder and looking at plastic alternatives, uh, how does that make you feel? You know, when you think about the station as a platform that can enable research and development for the benefit of humanity. No, that, that's really good. And, you know, governments can do some things, but governments are not always nimble vessels of innovation and, you know, governments are governments and companies are much more able to get stuff done. So for Estee Lauder to be financing this, um, they can get the money into the research at the right time. They can do it more efficiently and not have some of the overhead and waste that goes with government sometime. So a lot of my hope for the future comes from the business community. And the space station is a great platform for research because uh, it's subsidized. It's very heavily subsidized. Basically, companies can get to that weightless environment with astronauts doing work without the billions and billions of dollars that you would have to spend to build that. So all that subsidy of making the space station has already happened and they can just pay for the actual research, which makes it doable. If, if it wasn't for that, I'll call it a subsidy, you know, they would never be able to do things like this. So I'm really excited about companies. Um, there were some private labs, you know, the ISS National Laboratory is the one that most of them go through to get this work done on the space station. But kind of a lot of my hope for the future really comes through companies like Estee Lauder and others. And, you know, now that you've left NASA, I'm curious, you know, what life is like for you. I know that you're involved in some startups and some energy related concepts. Uh, so I'd love to hear more about that. Can you tell us what that's been like for you? Sure. So I've done a few books and the movies. That's kind of one half. I don't know if that's the right brain or left brain. I always get those confused. But the other half of my brain Energy has been my passion since I was a kid. Um, I remember reading about oil and nuclear power and all that in, when I was in school. And so I've always loved that. And the last few years, I've, I've started working in the energy industry. I have a, a startup company that we're hoping to build renewable diesel facilities um, in the Midwest using corn waste, which is super exciting. And I'm working with another really major oil and gas company and they're doing uh, energy transition. So things like carbon capture and geothermal and wind and solar. And they're, they're just developing all these other businesses that because they know that's the future. And they asked me to help them develop those businesses. So I've kind of been doing a bunch of different things in the energy industry and I love it. And that at the end of the day, you know, energy, I was talking to a friend of mine, I, I do guest lecturing at Harvard Business School and she was one of the students and she's, an, she's from West Africa. She's Ivarian. And when COVID happened, we were talking and I said, well, why are you guys, in? we were talking about masks and they buy them from China. I said, why are you buying masks from China? You have, I'm sure there's low cost labor in West Africa. And she said, Terry, we don't have electricity. Like they don't have enough electricity to run a plant to make masks. And so unless you have energy, you, you have extreme poverty. And that's something that that's the way to get people out. Unless you have clean energy, you have extreme pollution. <laughs> so you, you, we kind of need to thread the needle of having the energy, but making it not too dirty. 
And I'm curious to, you know, how have you seen research on the space station evolve over time and, and what are you looking forward to in the future? What are your hopes and, and what do you hope to see occurring on the space station in the future? Well, space station research really started back in the space shuttle because there was a lot of, when I flew my space shuttle mission, we had some uh, different research things. In fact, I had this one thing called GAP. It was like the tube that you put in the bank and the check, back when they used to have checks that would go to the teller. Uh, and we would twist it and it would infect these little worms called C. elegans. And the biologists would study how immune systems or whatever biologists study, it was a biology experiment. On the space station, we did the same thing, only it was in the big glove box. There was a lot more astronaut involvement. Um, and I actually did a really cool experiment for salmonella and E. coli vaccines through the University of Colorado. Um, so the, the science has gotten a lot more um, involved, in depth, advanced. Uh, we've also learned what works and what doesn't work. There's, there's kind of some things that, yeah, that's not gonna work. And that's one of the benefits of science. It's not like, it's a guaranteed return on investment. Sometimes you put money into it and it works. Sometimes you put money into it and it doesn't. So the space station has given us a lot of that learning, but the station is about research. It's not about operations or production. So there's another comp space company I'm working with and as, as an advisor, they actually want to manufacture things. And that is not something for the ISS, that, that's for other platforms. So they're going to make small satellites that make different materials in weightlessness that you can't make on earth or it's super expensive to make on earth. Uh, this, so those types of things, manufacturing and actually operations are going to be for future space stations or future unmanned spacecraft. Uh, but the space station is really about getting science done, science that's subsidized that would not otherwise be funded um, without that government support. Well, thank you so much, Terry, for answering my questions and, and going through all of that with me. It's so great to get your perspective and especially hear about what life was like in space for you and, and getting to see the planet as an actual planet. Uh, and I wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us today for such great conversations. I feel like there's going to be so much insight and, and wonderful action that comes out of all of this. So thank you all again for joining us today and I really appreciate your time. Ashley, thank you so much for moderating both of the sessions today, the fireside chat as well as the conversation with Terry. Hope that the audience equally was able to take something away from both of those conversations. Before we get into our closing announcements though, I would like to share one final video pitch. Hi, my name is Steve Meckler. I'm a member of the research staff at the Palo Alto Research Center Incorporated, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Xerox Corporation. Here, I'd like to present for the Sustainability Challenge Beyond Plastics, a project for the ISS titled Microgravity Synthesis of Aerogel Copolymers. Here at PARC, we're developing a carbon capture technology based on a polymer aerogel sorbent. The goal of this project is to use research on the International Space Station to improve the performance of these carbon capture aerogels. This will both allow us to reduce the amount of virgin polymer aerogel we need to manufacture to capture a given amount of CO2, and also to use the captured CO2 as an alternative feedstock for commodity polymer manufacturing. At a high level, the project will be comparing the properties of aerogels synthesized on the International Space Station to those synthesized here on Earth. This will allow us to develop design rules for the synthesis and manufacturing of the materials that will lead us to a commercial offering in the carbon capture space. We're budgeting $484,000 for this project over an 18-month period of performance. By this point, most people understand that climate change is one of the major challenges we're facing over the coming decades. And carbon capture is a critical tool we have in fighting climate change. But many carbon capture technologies have an unfortunate and unintended side effect in that the materials used for the carbon capture have a finite lifespan. And once they're spent, they'll end up as waste in landfills. Therefore, even moderate improvements to the CO2 capture performance of these materials can greatly reduce the amount of material ending up in landfills. And additionally, the CO2 that's captured can be used as an alternative feedstock for polymer production. Our hypothesis in this experiment is that convective forces during the polymerization of our aerogel sorbents, which would not be present in a microgravity synthesis, play a critical role in structuring the pores and chemicals within the aerogels in a way that will dictate the performance of the materials. And by doing this experiment on the ISS, we'll be able to optimize the formulation and manufacturing of the carbon capture materials. 
We require the use of the ISS for this because we need persistent microgravity over several days. We also require the samples to be returned to our labs at the end of our experiment so that we can post-process and analyze them. The proposed experiment was designed in close collaboration with staff at the International Space Station National Laboratory, as well as our chosen implementation partner, Aerospace Applications North America, who run a facility called Ice Cubes that will be used for this experiment. In this experiment, we'll load our reactions into vials, like the ones in the lower right-hand corner, on Earth, load them into an experiment cube, which are the blue boxes in the diagram on the upper right-hand corner, and then refrigerate that and launch it to the International Space Station, where a crew member will move it from the refrigerated container into the ice cubes facility, where we'll be able to control the reaction remotely. Because we've designed this to require zero chemical handling on station and minimal crew member intervention, we've reduced many of the risks associated with operation. For one, we've enhanced crew member safety, and we've also mitigated experimental risks associated with oxygen contamination of the samples. We will synthesize a parallel set of materials in an identical incubator on Earth, and then once the materials synthesized on the International Space Station or returned to us, we will post-process and analyze them to develop our new design rules. PARC and our parent company Xerox are actively engaged in the commercialization of this carbon capture aerogel technology. We have two Department of Energy projects that are currently funded with total funding in the area of around $3 million. And we also are looking, once we commercialize the carbon capture technology, to partner with or to find customers in the carbon utilization space for polymer production. Project success leading to greatly improved performance of our carbon capture aerogels would have tangible economic and commercial benefits. For one, it would accelerate Park's path to market in this rapidly growing carbon capture space, which is valued at $2 billion today, is expected to grow to $7 billion by the end of the decade, and to grow much further beyond that. It would allow us to provide a commercial offering where existing technology cannot meet the required specifications, our materials work very well at low CO2 concentrations where existing liquid amine technologies fail. The gigatons of CO2 we'll be capturing will provide an abundant amount of feedstock for emerging carbon negative polymer manufacturing processes. And these outcomes are aligned with growing regulatory, investor, and commercial pressure. We've requested $50,000 in matching funds from our organization, which is currently under review, for this $484,000 18-month project. We're very excited about this opportunity to do research on the International Space Station, and thank you for your time. Welcome back. Hope that you enjoyed those final two videos. And, and now I'd like to bring back into the fray Christine Kretz. So Christine had the opportunity to join our fireside chat a little bit earlier today. Um, I wanted to kind of ask you a question because you head up uh, programs and partnerships for the ISS National Lab. And this, the notion of having researchers submit pitches, that's a new thing for us. Can you maybe give a little bit of background about why we decided to go that route with this particular challenge? Sure, Patrick. Um, normally we read these kinds of things as a proposal and they're interesting and very deeply scientific. But we really wanted to share this with the public so they could see the kind of caliber of projects that we get to see and understand the kind of work that we're going to put up on the station. So we thought that the pitch idea would welcome the public in to see us. Well, I can, I can tell you, as someone that doesn't normally have the opportunity to see a lot of things from these pitches or proposals that are being submitted, it was also very educational from my perspective. So I thought it was great. Hopefully, uh, the general public thought so as well. That said, there was a bit of a competition associated yes. with this. Uh, I believe that we are trying to find the one that had the most fan engagement, and we are going to provide them with a Viewer's Choice Award. And I believe that you might have information on who won that. And I'm excited about that. I'd like to thank Boeing, first of all, for sponsoring the Viewer's Choice Award and all the people who voted. So thank you for joining us and voting for your favorite. And with that, let me introduce our winner, Hamali Rathnayaki, who is from the University of North Carolina with her team on in-space microbial production of nanocellulose hydrogels. So congratulations to Hamali and her team. We're really excited that you won, and we hope you enjoy this award. Uh, and speaking of the award, what is it that they're actually going to get, Christine? You know, it's a really terrific framed plaque that includes a flown U.S. flag.
Very cool. Not everyone gets space flown space stuff. Flown. That's, uh, that's awesome. Well, congratulations again to the team over at the University of North Carolina. Before we call it a day, though, there is one final announcement that, Christina, I think that you'd like to make relative to finalists. There are finalists, and we're really excited about that, too. So the finalists were chosen um, through a judging group that included scientists, operations people, and our friends at Estee Lauder, who sponsored this entire challenge. So those were chosen on the merits of the science. And so with that, let me give you the second runner-up, um, headed by Ariel Ekbla from MIT, and their project is Enhancing Microbial Consortium for Plastic Biodegradation. And th so that's the second runner-up. The first runner-up was headed by Katrina Knauer from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and their project was Biological Recycling of Plastic Waste. And last but not least, the top finalist is Steve Meckler and his team from Palo Alto Research Center. And they had a project on microgravity synthesis of aerogel copolymers. Congratulations to all of our winners. Uh, congratulations indeed. And, and you know, as, as Christine, as you alluded to, you know, these three finalists, we're not done yet. No. This is this is kind of like think of this as like the half halftime show, <laughs> where there's much more in this process. Where these three finalists, along with three additional teams, will have the opportunity to submit final proposals uh, as part of this challenge. And those cha and those proposals will be evaluated by your team, by the Estee Lauder team. And later this summer at the ISS Research and Development Conference, which will be held in person in Washington, D.C., we will hope to announce the winner or winners of this overall challenge. Is that correct? That is correct. We're excited to announce them later in July. Indeed we are. And, you know, before we get going, I, Christine, I think that there are some people that we also wanted to thank along the way that were really instrumental in allowing this event to come to fruition. I would like to thank our friends at Estee Lauder for sponsoring this challenge. Of course, our friends at Boeing, who sponsored the Viewer's Choice Award, and then our other um, events sponsors who are Echo and Close, Westlake Chemical, and No Sew Patches. We certainly appreciate your support. I, I, very much so. We appreciate the support. We also appreciate the fact that you, the audience, has decided that you wanted to take time out of your day to learn a little bit more about the research that's happening on the space station or the potential research that could be happening on the space station. So, you know, with that, I, I also want to thank you. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank Terry Vertz. I want to thank Ashley Strickland from CNN. Uh, and, and again, this was a really engaging conversation. Hope that the general public was able to learn something from this. And again, looking forward to, to talking much more about sustainability-related research on the International Space Station and announcing the winners of this sustainability challenge at ISS Research and Development Conference in Washington, D.C. later this summer. Thank you all so much. Have a fantastic weekend.